All right, so next up, we want to go over the central nervous system. So the central nervous system, this is going to consist of the spinal cord and the brain. Um, it's going to be ultimately responsible res for receiving sensory information, and it's going to also initiate that motor control. So this is really where we're going to find a lot of our interneurons, where we're taking our information from our motor neurons, um, or I'm sorry, we're taking information from our sensory neurons, uh, we're processing it, and then passing information on to our motor neurons. Um, both the spinal cord and the brain are going to be protected ultimately by bone. Um, either the vertebrae or the uh, skull are going to be responsible for protecting our central nervous system. Also, both the spinal cord and the brain are going to be wrapped in membranes known as meninges. Meningitis is going to be the infection of those men meninges. Um, it might be caused by bacteria or other viruses. Really, meningitis just means inflammation. That itis means inflammation or infection of that um, meninges. Another protection that we have for our central our central nervous system would be our cerebral spinal fluid. This is going to be found between the meninges. It helps cushion and protect the central nervous system. Um, so, for example, in a spinal tap or a lumbar puncture, um, some of that cerebral spinal fluid is going to be withdrawn for testing. Cerebral spinal fluid is also in the four ventricles of the brain and in the central canal of the spinal cord. The ventricles are going to be interconnected chambers that are filled with that cerebral spinal fluid. Now, normally excess fluid drains away into the cardiovascular system. However, it is possible for blockages to occur. In an infant, a brain can enlarge due to cerebral spinal fluid accumulation, resulting in a condition known as hydrocephalus, or water on the brain. Um, if cerebral spinal fluid collects at an adult, the brain cannot enlarge. The skull is, um, you know, it's it's already, those the fontanelles have closed. The skull is um, sealed up and there's no place for that brain to enlarge. So it gets pushed up against the skull. This can result in severe brain damage and it can ultimately be fatal. So the central nervous system is going to be composed of two different types of nervous tissue, gray matter and white matter. Gray matter contains cell bodies and short non-myelinated axons. White matter, on the other hand, contains myelinated axons that run together in bundles called tracks. Here is a diagram or a cross section of, of the spinal cord. I'm sorry, I've got hiccups. The spinal cord is going to extend from the base of the brain up through the foramen magnum. So that's going to be that small hole in the skull that we've already mentioned. Um, and it's going to travel through the vertebral canal. So it's going to be right in here is where our um, spinal cord is going to travel. Um, now there are a couple of structures of the spinal cord. Here is a cross section of the spinal cord. It shows the central canal, um, gray matter, and white matter. You're going to see that we have gray matter on the inside and white matter found around the outside. Um, the spinal nerves are going to project from the cord through small openings in the um, vertebrae known as the intervertebral foram foramina. Fibrocartilage inter intervertebral discs are going to separate those vertebrae. If a disc, disc ruptures or herniates, it can compress that spinal nerve. It's going to result in pain um, and potentially loss of mobility. Now, the primary goal of that spinal cord is going to um, conduct messages between the brain and the body. However, it can serve as a reflex center, which we'll talk a little bit about later on. So the gray matter is going to be centrally located. Like I said, we're going to see gray matter in the center, the white matter wrapped around the outside. Now the dorsal root of a spinal nerve is going to contain sensory fibers um, entering into that gray matter. The ventral root of the spinal nerve is going to contain two motor fibers that are exiting out of that, um, that are exiting out of that gray matter. The dorsal and the ventral roots join and form, um, forming a mixed nerve. Now the spinal nerves are going to be part of the peripheral nervous system. The white matter is going to surround the gray matter. White matter is going to be made of ascending tracks carrying information to the brain and descending tracks taking information away from the brain. Now there are a lot of different functions for the spinal cord, um, but it's going to act primarily as a gateway for pain signals. Um, motor signals from the brain can pass down the spinal cord and out into the muscles. Um, 
where so uh, where it's going to be part of a reflex arc. Um, paralysis is going to be loss of sensation and voluntary control. Um, you may have heard the terms paraplegia or uh, quadriplegia. Uh, paraplegia is if damage is in the thoracic region of the spinal cord. The lower body and the legs will be paralyzed. But in the case of quadriplegia, uh, the damage is going to be up in the neck region and all four limbs are going to be affected. Um, so like we said, the the spinal cord is going to function as a center for reflex arcs. Now there are a couple of different stim or steps to a reflex arc. So for example, a stimulus could cause the sensory receptors to generate signals that then travel in sensory axons to the spinal cord. Inside the spinal cord are interneurons that can integrate that incoming data and relay signals to the motor neurons right away instantaneously so the message doesn't necessarily have to travel all the way up to the brain in order to initiate a motor response. Those motor axons can cause skeletal muscles to contract. Um, they can also affect smooth muscle organs or glands. So like I said, the spinal cord can can create reflex arcs for those internal organs. So when your blood pressure falls, internal receptors in the carotid arteries and aorta can send signals up the ascending tract to the cardiovascular center of the brain. Then motor signals, signals can pass down the descending tract in the spinal cord and out to the blood vessels where they're going to constrict and thus increase the blood pressure. All right, so next up is the brain, another very important part of the central nervous system. The brain is gonna be made up of the cerebrum, diencephalon, cerebellum, and brainstem. The brainstem is also called the telencephalon. This is going to be the largest region of the brain, and it's the very last region to receive sensory input and carry out integration before commanding voluntary motor responses. It's gonna be responsible for communicating with and coordinating the activities in the other parts of the brain. So here is an overview of the human brain. We have our cerebrum is going to be found up here in this region. The cerebellum is going to be located down here. The diencephalon right towards the middle and then the brain stem branching down from there. The brain, we're going to talk just a little bit about the cerebral hemispheres. Um, so the brain can be broken down into two different regions, a right and a left hemisphere. Right down the middle, we have a longitudinal fissure. It's just like that deep groove that divides the right and left cerebral hemispheres. Um, now we can communicate across um, that fissure via the corpus callosum. It's an extensive bridge of nerve tracks um, that allows the two halves of the brain to communicate. Uh, gyri, or the single singular, it's gyrus, um, these thick folds that you see that sort of give that brain that wrinkly old walnut sort of texture. Um, these are going to be the thick folds separated by shallow grooves called sulci. So those cerebral hemispheres, those are going to be divided into four different lobes. We'll have the frontal lobe, which is going to be in the most anterior. Uh, the parietal lobe is found just behind that. Uh, the occipital lobe is just further than that. And then the temporal lobe is going to be inferior to the frontal and parietal lobe, so found just below. And here is um, a diagram of that. So here we have our frontal lobe, we have the parietal lobe, and then we have um, the occipital lobe back here. All right, so what we want to do next is break down the different regions and functions of the brain. So the brain is going to contain sensory motor and association areas. The sensory areas, like the prim primary somatosensory area, is going to be responsible for receiving that sensory information from the body. And we also have motor areas, of course. The primary motor area is going to control the skeletal muscles. The premotor cor pre -motor cortex is going to coordinate learned motor skills. We also have association areas located throughout the brain. They are going to be responsible for communicating with the sensory area, motor areas, and other parts of the brain to analyze and act as a sensory input. The prefrontal cortex is going to enable us to reason and think. Here's a breakdown of some of the different areas of the brain and what they are going to be responsible for. Um, both the primary uh, somatosensory area, this is going to be where we 
taken information from the tongue and pharynx, or we take in information from the teeth and gums. Up here is where we take in information from the leg, foot, and toes. Um, and then the primary motor area is going to be found just in front of that, um, and it's going to be associated with all of those same regions, but now it's going to be responsible for controlling um, those various regions. So we're going to break down the brain just a little bit further. We're going to talk a little bit about the diencephalon. The diencephalon is going to include the hypothalamus, thalamus, and penile gland. And it's going to uh, encircle the third ventricle of the brain. Now the hypothalamus is primarily an integration center. It's going to be responsible for integrating all of the input um, that comes in and the messages going out. And it's also immediately going to be responsible for regulating hunger, sleep, thirst, body temperature, water balance. It's going to control the pituitary gland, which is going to serve as a link between the nervous and endocrine systems. You're going to find that all of the different body systems are going to be um, have crossover. There's going to be a lot of integration between the various um, body systems. The penile gland is going to be um, where and how, well, the hypothalamus controls the pituitary gland, and it's going to um, be that link, that bridge in between our uh, nervous system and our endocrine system. The thalamus, another region of the diencephalon, it's going to consist of two masses of gray matter. It's going to be responsible for receiving sensory input, um, except for the sense of smell that's going to be processed elsewhere. It's going to send that information, that sensory information, onto the ver various areas of the cerebrum. Now, the penile gland, also located in the diencephalon, is going to be responsible for secreting the hormone melatonin, which helps regulate your daily rhythms, um, and helps with like monitoring sleep and um, and other things like that. All right, next up we have the cerebellum. The cerebellum is going to be located just under the occipital lobe. This is going to be separated fr from the brainstem by a fourth ventricle. Now this is primarily composed of white matter and kind of like a tree-like branching pattern. Um, because of that pattern, it's uh, referred to as the arbor vitae. Um, it's going to be branching and overlaying the white matter in a thin, or overlaying that white matter is going to be a very thin layer of gray matter that's going to help form some very complex folds. This region, the cerebellum, is going to be responsible for maintaining our posture and balance. It also pr produces very smooth and coordinated voluntary movements. Moving down from there, we're going to find the brainstem. The brainstem can be broken down into three regions, the midbrain pons and medulla oblongata. The midbrain is going to be our relay station. This is going to process the information between the cerebrum and the spinal cord, or the cerebellum. So it has, um, because of this, because it's sort of our relay center, it's also going to have reflex centers for visual, auditory, and tactile senses. The pons is going to be responsible for communicating between the cere cerebellum and the rest of the central nervous system. With the medulla oblongata, this is going to be responsible for regulating our breathing rate. Reflex centers coordinate head movements um, in response to visual, visual and auditory stimuli. Um, but, uh, but is also, oh, I'm sorry, like I said, it's also responsible for regulating our breathing rate with the medulla oblongata. Medulla oblongata contains reflex centers for regulating heart bright, heartbeat, breathing, and vasoconstriction. So that vasoconstriction is ultimately responsible for our blood pressure. We can increase or decrease um, that blood pressure by controlling the constriction of the blood vessels. It also contains the reflex centers for vomiting, coughing, sneezing, hiccuping, and swallowing. Above the spinal cord, um, it contains tracts that ascend or descend between the spinal cord and the higher brain centers. Before we leave the brain, we do want to mention the Reticular Activating System, or RAS. Now, this is going to be an extensive network of neurons that runs through the medulla and it projects to the cerebral cortex. This is going to be responsible for filtering sensory input and help keeping that cerebral cortex in alert state. All right, so that's our central nervous system. Um, Make sure that you are able to list the functions of the spinal cord and summarize the major regions of the brain and their general functions. Um, and then also spend a little bit of time reading up on the, um, on the RAS and see if you can um, 
describe how the RAS is going to play a role in maintaining homeostasis. So that's my challenge for you for this section.